Zero-One Files, this is Mike. On Sunday morning of May 2nd, 1999, parishioners of Weimar, Texas, would gather together at church for their weekly Sunday services. Priest Cernig and his wife Karen, who had never been late before, did not arrive. A few of his followers went to his house and tried to find him. They knocked on the door, but no one answered. Their door was unlocked. They went inside and discovered the slain couple in their bed. The local police rushed to the scene and started an investigation. There was no trace of fighting in the house, but Karen had been sexually assaulted and rolled inside a bed sheet. Police believe that the suspect got into the house through an unlocked garage door the night before and used the hammer from the house to commit the murder. It had been 70 years since Weimar had experienced this kind of terrible tragedy. The local police force had only seven officers and therefore did not have the capacity to handle the case. They passed the case to the FBI and Texas Ranger. Officers first thought that it was a case of burglary gone wrong, but with detailed investigation, they believed that the suspect was planning the murder. The suspect had stayed in the home for a period of time. He ate food from the kitchen, picked up a few pieces of jewelry, and searched everything inside the house. He left his fingerprints all over the house and finally drove away in Sir Nick's car. According to officials, this case was very similar to the one that happened in West University Place five months previously. On December 16, 1998, 39 years old Claudia Benton was attacked and sexually assaulted in her home. Claudia's body was also discovered rolled inside the bed sheet. The suspect ate food from the house, picked up a few jewelry pieces, and a guitar. Crime tools used also belong to the house. Both cases also share a common aspect, as both victims' homes were located near the train rails. From Claudia's autopsy report, DNA linked the three victims to an illegal Mexican immigrant, Rafael Resenders. Rafael of no fixed address without any identification documents became the prime suspect. In the past 25 years, Rafael had been arrested for violent attacks, illegal break-in, and burglary. He used more than nine different names and had been deported back to Mexico many times, but was always able to find his way back into the United States. Rafael climbed onto US-bound cargo trains, riding them back across the border. Officials believe that Rafael rode one of the cargo trains into Weimar. After breaking into Cernik's house, he drove off in his car to the next cargo train stop. He then climbed onto a train again to escape to the next location. There was a strong possibility that Rafael would continue to commit crimes with new victims. Police announced a $50,000 reward for information that would lead to Rafael's whereabouts. Weimar citizens were worried and frustrated that they could become the next victims. Police officers tried to reassure the citizens, telling them that the suspect would not attack the same town twice. They were wrong. On June 4th, 1999, one month after the Cerny couple's attack, 73 years old Josephine Kanwika was killed in her home. She lived alone just 5 kilometers away from Cerny's home. Evidence from the scene showed that Rafael jumped into the house through a window and picking up a pickaxe, using it as murder weapon. After the attack, he ate a few pears from the house, make a toast before leaving. While the investigators continued with the search, Houston police called a mention that a similar case had happened in their jurisdiction as well. 26-year-old Noemi Dominguez was sexually assaulted and killed at her home, located near a rail line. The forensic report indicated that after the murder, Rafael then drove away in Noemi's car and headed towards Josephine's house in Weimar. Why did Rafael return to Weimar to find his next victim? In Josephine's house, police found a folded newspaper on the sofa with Rafael on the front page headline. In the bedroom, they found a brand new toy train that did not belong to Josephine. It was obvious that Rafael purposely came back to provoke the police. Citizens that lived near the railway were panicked. Many old women found vintage guns and asked police how to fire them. Many residents decided to leave and stay with friends and family outside town. Texas police asked for extra support teams to patrol and search along the rail. 
They also connected with temporary shelters and border customs to get more information on Rafael. There had already been five known victims. Officers working around the clock in hopes of catching Rafael as soon as possible. Investigators found out that on August 29, 1997, in Lexington, Kentucky, a young couple had been attacked. 21-year-old Christopher was killed. His girlfriend Holly was assaulted and seriously injured. Fortunately, Holly survived her attack, and she remembered the suspect's face clearly. She identified a scratch that matched perfectly with Rafael. With this finding, police conclude that Rafael started his assault crimes more than two years ago. With further investigation on similar cases, officials believed that there was a possibility of even more victims than previously thought, and upward of even more than 10, and he could appear in any state in the US to find his next victim. In the media conference, the FBI announced Rafael as one of the top 10 most wanted people in the US making the same list as Osama bin Laden at the time. Evidence showed that Rafael loved to climb onto eastbound San Antonio trains to Weimar, and then returns west with the victim's car. In June, hundreds of police officers with their search dogs patrolled the nearby railway. They also built platforms to monitor the tops of the trains. They stopped all the trains that came through and used helicopters to search. During this operation, Police arrested 20 illegal immigrants, but no were fell. A few days later, in a Louisville homeless shelter, a worker saw the man eating at a canteen whose face matched the description of Rafael. He checked the flyers and was sure it was Rafael. He called 911. However, by the time he made his call to the police, Rafael was gone. Officials continued their search. On the day of Noemi and Josephine were murdered, Rafael was stopped at the U.S. border for fingerprints. At that time, the customs data was not connected with the FBI, so customs officers did not know that Rafael was a wanted suspect. Rafael was an illegal immigrant with no fixed permanent address. He boarded trains traveling to different places, randomly picking victims living near railway lines. Officials thought that they needed to expand their search area to be proactive. The special investigations team alerted the media, releasing Rafael's pictures to raise the public's attention. They also increased the reward a few times. Rafael headlines in US news reports caught the attention of Mexican public. A person recognized Rafael and reached out to the media where Rafael once lived. Local Mexican media started reporting the case, trying to interview Rafael's family. Investigators found out that Rafael was married and his wife lived in Mexico. He also had a stepsister who lived in the U.S. Officials found Rafael's wife for an interview and realized that she had no idea what Rafael had done in the U.S. She mentioned that Rafael crossed Mexico-U.S. border frequently. He always brought back some jewelry and a guitar once. Most of these items were taken from the victims. Even with the involvement of the Mexican government and the cooperation of Rafael's family in the investigation, there was no major breakthrough. One week had passed since Rafael's last attack. Texas citizens were nervous that he was going to do it again. On June 15, Rafael appeared in Goran, Illinois. 80 years old George Morber and his daughter, 52 years old Carolyn Fadry, were killed in their home. It was located just 90 meters away from the rail. Rafael was not trying to cover up his identity. He left his fingerprints and blood at the scene. He thought that the police could not catch him. As usual, Rafael drove the victim's car towards a nearby village and jumped onto a train to escape back to Mexico. Officials increased the reward to 125,000 to anyone who has information leading to Rafael's location. It was to tell Rafael that there was nowhere to escape. Mexican and U.S. bounty hunters were competing to get a reward. Bounty hunters in Mexico hid near Rafael's family home as they heard that Rafael was back. Bounty hunters did not care if Rafael was alive or dead. They just wanted to bring him back to the U.S. and collect the reward money. Rafael was under attack from all sides. 
On July 12, 1999, Rafael's sister called the police. Rafael was afraid that he would be killed by the bounty hunters, so he agreed to surrender. One day after, Rafael was arrested by the police at the El Paso Bridge. His trial began on May 8, 2000. All the evidence was undisputed. The prosecutors suggested to give Rafael the death penalty. Defense lawyers argue that Rafael had mental issues. Therefore, he could not differentiate between right or wrong. He also claimed that he was on a mission from God to kill those that are evil. Prosecutor refuted the defense and said that Rafael had a clear intent targeting victims that were old and frail. Additionally, victims were always located near the railway, further showing that the murders were planned. As he noticed police were closing in on him in Texas, he fled to Illinois to continue his crimes. In the case of Claudia Benton's murder, Rafael purposely closed her garage door before him driving away to avoid raising the neighbor's attention. Prosecutors argue that if Rafael thought that it was a mission from God, why did he sexually assault the victims? And why only did he sexually assault younger victims? The defense lawyer was speechless. Rafael commit crimes 23 times and murdered more than 16 victims. On May 18, 2000, Rafael was sentenced to first-degree murder with the death penalty.